Today, we're actually giving thanks for the life of a woman by the name of Fanny Crosby. Has anybody heard of Fanny Crosby? She is not somebody particularly a part of our Episcopal Anglican tradition. In fact, at at one level, by her membership, not at all. She was born in the late 1800s in the county of Putnam, New York, a Methodist, uh, always was a Methodist, and never even had any inkling of becoming an Episcopalian. And yet, her hymnody, particularly through Lift Every Voice, as well as some not-so-secret Methodist and Baptist organists in our midst, have introduced her prolific hymnody into the flow of our tradition. She actually penned over 9,000 hymns. And the remarkable thing about it was she was blind. Fanny, born seeing, was actually rendered blind by a quack doctor who gave her the wrong treatment to what should have been a normal childhood illness, rendering her blind for the rest of her life. But she was one not to feel sorry for herself. In fact, somebody, people would say, because she was extraordinarily bright, incredibly talented in a bunch of various ways, played several instruments, was a world-class student of poetry, thanks to the New York Society of the Blind, of which she was both a student and then later a teacher. And someone said something to the effect of, You know, it's a pity that you are so gifted and that you're you're still blind. And this is her response. Now, this is a, a little stanza to a poem that she wrote when she was eight years old. And she said, Oh, what a happy soul I am, though I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. So to weep, and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. She carried that kind of resolution through the rest of her life. She actually became personal friends of several presidents. She was, in fact, in her time, a known celebrity. If there is anybody who could have penned, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long, It was Fanny Crosby. Now, (laughs) the lessons are legion, are they not? I mean, there are a lot of ways that you can deal with that, and I want to offer two. One is the joy of her life, praising my Savior all the day long. The whole thrust of the lessons, but particularly the epistle lesson, lays out for us cause for our rejoicing as Christians. It's actually, I think it's actually a breathtaking passage. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It's like, get the point? Kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. What it says in an essence is, number one, God has said of you and me, you are mine. You are mine. And believe me, if we are being protected by the power of God for a salvation to be revealed at the last time, That means I can count on the fact that who's going to get me to heaven is not my own resolve. I mean, brothers and sisters, be realistic. Sometimes my resolve's pretty good. Sometimes it's dreadful. Particularly when I actually want to give in to the temptation that is in front of me. Hello? Are you there? (laughs) In other words, if I had to rely on myself To find a way to get from here to glory, I would be very unsure indeed. As I I often say, um, and it's not original, past performance is a great predictor of future behavior. 
well, if, if my past performance was in any way a predictor of future behavior, and that was tied to my eternal destiny, I would feel nervous to say the least. <laughs> so, but if I know that I am kept by God's power for this salvation, and in this context, it really does mean deliverance, which is one of the meanings of the word salvation. Deliverance from sin, fear, hell, and death. That's a whole different story. And here's what it does and doesn't do. Well, let's start with the negative first. What it doesn't do is set me free to go, oh, well, I don't have to worry then. I can just do whatever the heck I want. Sin boldly, to quote Luther. <laughs> Although there's some that take it that way. No, actually, just the opposite. If it also is true, as it says in the same epistle, Without having seen him, which is, of course, poignant for Fanny as someone blind. Without having seen him, you love him. Then that actually gets in the deepest part of my own motivations. Despite my temptations and my broken past behavior, my desire, you see, is to please this one who loves me so dearly, who knows all that there is to know about me and more. And though, yes, oft I stray, to quote one of her hymns, the fact of the matter is, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that his forgiveness and mercy is always greater than even my resolve to rebel. Because as you know, some sins are unintentional, but others are quite intentional. See? That's a place of deep, you see, comfort. Who, who loves you like that? Honestly, I don't know many people do. Almost all of our loves that we experience relationally are in some way conditional. It's just a part of the limitation of what it means to be human. Only God, only God, can be the one to fill the gaps in all of those places where our hearts long for forgiveness and mercy in the midst of our own inner frustrations, joys, and sorrows, and know that it is He who will carry us home. Thank God it's not our resolve. Sure, we say yes because we want to please Him. But we also know that there are occasions that our, west, our yes can have certain qualifications. He knows all of who we are and continues to work out his will and draw us forward more deeply into his life and in his presence. So that we live not under judgment, but under his mercy. If Sisters and brothers, if that does not inspire love in you, then I would urge you to go to God and say, Lord, please change my cold heart. So here's Fanny. She would have had every reason to be resentful and angry and basically say with a certain sort of ruthfulness combined with a certain Yankee determination. I'm going to make the best of this, but I'm sure not happy. That's actually what would be expected of most people. She did not go that way at all. And the difference, the difference was Jesus. The difference always is Jesus. For him to work in us, including the things that we cannot work in ourselves. That capacity to be able to walk with him in the midst of, not just despite the trials and the difficulties that surely come and do come our way. So that we can say with her, I am his. He will never let me go. And so my story, my song, 
is to praise him. Now, I should say amen and go back. <laughs> that's, the, that's sort of the high point. But I want to do a PS specifically for who you all are as an altar guild. We believe very deeply, and it's a deep tradition with us from literally the very beginnings of the writings of the New Testament through people um, like, you know, do it, praising God in the midst of the ordinary and the pots and pans, the sense that all work is sacred. But I would want to take it one step further in the light of Fanny's witness. And that is to say that in the ironing, in the setting up, in the sewing and repairs, in the purchasing, in the dressing of the altar, that those things are in fact expressions of our love for him. If it's not, it is the idol of I need it to happen my way. And fellow members of this dear and sacred order, there is no in-between. Either you are doing this as an expression of your love, or you, do, or you are doing it to feed your own self-importance. So that either you're a servant to the love of God, or you are a master wanting your way. That's always the master wanting her own way. That's the character tour, right? I mean, I think I told you this joke. Last year, you know, what's the difference between a member of the altar guild and a terrorist? You can negotiate with a terrorist, you know. I, I, I want to encourage you to live down because it doesn't have to be that way. I, I've been in working sacristies with women going about their business, and there's a kind of community joy that is almost infectious, that has genuinely inspired me as a priest. And a reverence for what one does in a way that literally sets a tone for what can happen in the rest of the service. You see, it's not about being snobby about making sure the linens are ironed and the silver is polished well. It can be that way. But if it's to the glory of God as an expression of your love for him and a desire to make sure that what happens up here actually reflects the very best that we can give because he is the one to whom we owe our lives, that's different. So what is your story? What is your song? How do you praise your Savior? To serve faithfully in the capacity that God has given you. It looks like this. A genuine care. An expression of true kindness. Of servanthood to the people who show up for services. Because it's always nice to hear it looked great this morning. But the deepest desire is, oh God, use this to draw people to you. Why? Because I want you to join in with praising my Savior, not me, all the day long. Amen.